Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Welcome, everyone. This has become a wonderful annual event in our college, the Pellerin Travel Study Presentation and the announcement of the next, uh, next Travel uh, Award winner, the next Pellerin recipient. So tonight I'm thrilled to introduce Alina Kiladite. That's close enough, I think. Um, <laughs> who was, uh, uh, I think, let's say the unanimous choice as a Pellerin winner uh, last year. Uh, Alina had an outstanding travel study proposal that built on her, um, her outstanding graduate career here and her particular interest in the process of design. And one, um, I, I think one thing that we thought was just outstanding about uh, not only Alina's work but her, her study proposal is that she, um, she wanted to go out and connect with people um, outside of the U.S., in Europe specifically, and um, interview people about design process and also engage uh, the buildings that they were describing, the process of design that led to these buildings. Um, we felt like she would also be a fantastic ambassador for LTU. And uh, I guess we'll see in the presentation how that worked out. Um, so just the agenda for this evening, um, Alina will have her presentation and we'll do a short question and answer following her presentation. And then uh, we will, Adrian uh, Abrams will say a few words about both the alumni um, association as well as the Pellerin Award itself and how that relates to the alumni association and LTU in general. And then I'll, um, I'll, I will introduce the uh, Pellerin nominees for this year, and ultimately we'll work down to announcing the Pellerin winner. Okay, so without further ado, let me get Alina set up and she can start a presentation. An appreciation for what I'm trying to achieve tonight. Um, so everything started uh, last year in uh, fall after I was awarded um, uh, with the, the travel um, fellowship. So um, how I ended up being um, uh, nominated it was um, developing a thesis project and then developing a proposal. So um, I'm um, up here, you can see what I was uh, proposing. It was really short because all I wanted um, with this uh, travel fellowship was to have a chance probably once in my lifetime to go and meet people that design buildings I was appreciated and influenced by during my whole uh, educational career. So I thought there is nothing I can lose. It's, you know, I can propose anything and if I would have this chance it would be amazing. So I, uh, I was wondering what, you know, what can I uh, find out if I go there? What is um, there to be discovered that by reading or just by even seeing the buildings um, will not um, expose me to, to everything. So um, I wanted to understand about the design process, about how they came up with the idea for a certain project and how they developed the project from a con conceptual idea to um, uh, building. Um, so um, during my uh, years of uh, education, I end up going back and forth to some um, websites or reading about some architects and uh, uh, it, for me, it was really easy to propose who I want to see. I knew I can go in my favorites and I know exactly who are those people. So, um, starting with um, the first firm I went to was a really small firm in Paris, Rollinet and Associates. Um, then I started going up and up and um, I realized, okay, I, um, I'm trying to achieve this goal of um, talking with um, you know architects that are already accomplished but in a way I want to understand other students how they develop certain projects that for me were inspira inspirational so because um, my thesis was uh, 
focused on using parametric tools, I end up going um, and trying to find and get answers from uh, certain students that were investigating the same uh, tools. So I went to AA, which is one of the famous um, using parametric tools in the prison. So I went there and I, um, I interview um, a student and then from a student and um, an, um, professor. And um, as network works, it happens that um, I visit the school, I visit the student, I uh, end up uh, going to uh, Zaha Hadid from uh, that um, connection. So it's it evolved unexpectedly. So even though certain firms weren't um, um, didn't answer in the beginning, I found ways of connecting with them, either networking or by coincidence how I end up talking with Peter Cook is just by going to a certain event that he was um, present to. So I had my chance to have uh, him uh, talk with me. So um, uh, I went to, um, from um, uh, Zaha Hadid, I ended up talking with people in Foster. And um, this was in London and UK. And from London, I went to Netherlands and uh, talked with um, people from uh, UN Studio. I went to Delft, um, where I met uh, Peter Cook. And then I went to Rotterdam, and I spoke uh, with M uh, people from MVRDV. Um, I, the last interview I uh, have, and it was my last firm to visit, was uh, not an architecture firm. I'm really interested in graphics too, so I keep going to a certain uh, firm that is doing um, amazing websites, and I end up actually going to talk with them and uh, realizing they have actually a building that I wasn't aware of. Uh, built because they are so conceptual and so digital oriented that I didn't know about it. So I will start first with um, um, the, s the firm in Paris, uh, Rolina and Associates, and the building I, um, I uh, went to see and uh, uh, talk about is uh, called um, Chapelle de Diaconés. It appeared in uh, Architectural Record in 2009 while I was doing my master two weeks project. And I was trying to understand what can you produce in two weeks that uh, it's simple, it's clean, and they were one of the firms that really influenced it during that time. So um, I will let uh, Mr. Rolinet uh, take you through and just uh, um, explain you what was at least some idea on uh, how do they came up with the concept of the building. some decision about the construction. After, we have discussion with the community for four months. The, the building was rebuilt on the middle of the ground. And, uh, and the program, the program with, uh, with the square meter. One important thing in church is that in the day and the night. And during the day, in the tradition, we have a window with color. The, the program was no vitro. But the light is very important. This decision is the result from the main discussion with the community. And one day, I was in a plane between Lisbon and Paris. I make a design like this. Very simple now. I threw when the fly was over. It was a good, the good idea. Very simple. Glasses, wood, uh, What are the input from your team into the project? Around the table. And we make many, many uh, sketch and, uh, and design and explication of many, many actions. And after we, we think it's correct, we make a, a simulation in three dimension with SketchUp or something or uh, something like that. And in parallel, we make a decision about the structure. When we have with a computer make the, the direction of the construction, uh, always uh, with a hand. When we are sure it's a good solution, we go on the computer. 
So uh, what I learned for, from them is that uh, being a small firm, they ca can afford to go back and forth to um, sketch and computer and models and keep on developing the design while um, they develop the, the digital one. Things that in other firms they they don't have the the option because of the scale of the project they work with, um, and um, I found really interesting that um, people in the office were yeah we we change um, you know the the proposal even in the last hour, and for me it was really interesting how can they they do that and keep still. Um, producing and having an outstanding building in the end. So um, I went um, to UN Studio and uh, one of the buildings I wanted to talk with them about was Mercedes Museum. And um, the reason why I wanted to talk about it is um, I had a project during my undergrad uh, level where I had to produce um, um, art center where the circulation had to be ramps and when you go and research for case studies you always end up going to somewhere so um, for me they solve um, the circulation in Mercedes Museum in such a beautiful way and the people interact amazing with the space because of that so I wanted to understand how did they come up with the idea and how they uh, develop it along the whole design process to build. Um, we won an architectural competition uh, for this project. The basis of this project for us was really to develop a strategy how we could make the circulation work in relation to the collection that this company museum had. So one important item for them was to show a kind of historical breakdown, let's say from the first car up to the latest prototypes, which is a kind of chronologic storyline. But next to that they had a lot of team exhibitions. We were really studying how we could bring that together mm -hmm. in one building and allow people to choose either one of these lines, so the themed lines or the chronological line, but also be able to change from one line to the other. So it was quite a big puzzle we had to solve. We found a very good reference for the way we organized the building in the, in the DNA structure, which shows the two storylines uh, that we have, so the chronological line and the team-based line, then constantly allowing for this kind of cross crossing over between these two lines and crossing back to the other line. So what we did is we bring the people up to the highest level of the museum and they can basically make a choice. They might take the chronological line and then wind yourself down on this spiral, this threshold. Or choose the other line, but you could also make cross connections between the lines going back and forth or make your own mix of collection. And this was the, the most powerful idea we brought in, in the competition phase and also the basis for our success in that competition phase. To build it you need information and this uh, information is quite complex from the geometry of the building and we had little time to build it. So we set up a parametric uh, design process and that meant we had the kind of modern geometry model uh, of which you see the 2D version here on the left side. And all these lines were parametrically connected. They're all tangent lines to each other. And by pulling one line, because let's say a structural wall had become thicker, all the other lines would update. With the 3D models, which involved the structural engineer, but also with uh, mechanical and electrical advisors to find this full integration. In between all these wires and cables, we still have to pour in some concrete, which you can see here that the complexity and the amount of uh, ductwork which is cast into the concrete is uh, fairly high. And this is what it had to lead to. With. Then, of course, the development of the facade structure, which was also completely done in 3D software. And this is also the level we communicated with the facade company. And an important element, of course, is, is fire safety in this building. Uh, which is not that easy to solve if you want to create a building which has large galleries opening to a main area and you don't want to close it up with glass. So the idea that was brought forward is to create a kind of uh, human-created uh, twister. 
uh, in the atrium. So we have this round holes in the main course and they're on air nozzles. They are under an angle, so they will create this kind of spin. So as soon as there's smoke, uh, we will create this uh, rotating air movement that will suck out all the smoke from the galleries. And this big hole in the top of the roof is a big ventilator that will then suck the air out and blow it out of the roof. So first we tested it on a 1 to 24 scale in a plastic uh, model. It proved to be working there and then the fire department said, okay, fine. But before you open the building, you have to prove it in real life. So the image you see on the left side is from the actual uh, smoke test we did in the building just uh, a few weeks before opening. And luckily it worked, so we could open the building. And it gave us uh, access to the Guinness Book of Records uh, for the largest uh, human created twister uh, in the building. So you see that a lot of innovative uh, technology had to be brought in to make this building possible, which didn't only ask for the creativity of the architect, but also for the fire advisors and the mechanical advisors to, to really serve the architecture in, uh, in that sense. After talking with them, is uh, the use of parametrics. It's not limited to just designing cool shapes or skins or volumes. It's actually to control the design process. So uh, going next to MVRTV, um, this is a more personal connection with them. So uh, the building I wanted to talk about with them um, is called Uzoko apartment building so um, the reason why I wanted to go there is um, I started my studies in Romania um, and I do remember seeing um, um, the building in magazines and for me it was something amazing I never designed in the, in the, in the so it didn't I never imagine how from a communist government and building an environment you can go to such an extreme where you can express things in the buildings and um, I never imagined I will end up going and visiting because of the borders um, restrictions and financial so um, I thought um, you know besides the fact that they do amazing design I can go and um, see my dream coming true, going and visiting the firm, visiting the building, and this um, being accomplished, not from Romania, being accomplished from the States, sending uh, from a university here. So for me, this building is more than just investigating the design. It's more achieving something on a personal level go straight to, to what it was, but it was by coincidence, the design went in a certain direction and it turned into this building. And uh, we have an official version, which is kind of how, the, how we wanted to optimize the, the use of the space for the area. And during that meeting we, we, we showed different models and it wasn't going so so well, so we had a bit of a problem. Until this, this guy said, hey, we have another model there, why don't you show that one? And we said, nah, yeah. Because it was not so, such a good model, we thought it was too expensive and so But then he put it wrongly, so instead of the patio, he made it into a slab. And then the little towers were fancy delivering all the stuff. It was nice. And, and, and at, this, at this moment, I said, okay, yeah, yeah, it could actually be resolved like that, although it was meant like this. So, hey, yeah, that's a really good, interesting. And, and then we, we took that further into the next meeting and then turned into this. Building. So, this is that the design is rational, but the starting point became coincidence. Something that is in the official, let's say, story of the, of the project is that there's a slab and it doesn't fit, which is also true, but, but then these two came together, so that it, it happened to be a perfect mo model on that spot, because it was complicated to fit in the zoning level, and it was a way, it, everything matched south facade, and then you look to the to the to the middle. But in the north facade you have this fantastic view mm -hmm. with great skies and clouds and what that actually is. Yeah. How do you see the the firm evolving? Because this, this, this we see that when people come working for us, you immediately see what's the latest let's say uh, fashion in, in, in architecture school. It's the way how we can merge uh, for instance, agriculture and urbanity, toys, 
one, one of the topics that we're interested in can the city feed itself. So for the design, what type of tools are you using? Uh, I see you have a lot of physical models and uh, you talk about going through with the Uzoko at least through a few uh, models to understand yeah. alternatives. Simple models just to test uh, next to and but also com computer. And I think that, that combination is, is, is interesting because you yeah, just to see, to see directly with a model but just to simple phone models and uh, straightforward computer methods during the design process and then later on more refined. More and more refined. But, uh, but yeah, sometimes it has to, go, has to work really fast. So that's, that's the only downside of these competitions that you have to do so much work in such a short time. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, but it, it also brings you new ideas. So that's it, good for the it, to, to feed the creative process yeah. to do these competitions as well next to uh, Balance is too much, but to one one side, you, yeah, you, you notice it immediately that people get uh, worn out, and, and, and yeah, it's it's also not good. So we have to have some kind of optimal combination of competition work, uh, research work, uh, construction projects, uh, master planning. So it should be quite diverse. Yeah. So what I learned from them is that uh, the use of models really help them, especially in this uh, project. Just because the the concept came up by a misplace of a model, instead of being placed um, the way they envision it, somebody flipped it. Um, also, what I found interesting is that they count a lot on students to be always up to date. So they think it's a really important thing to have students. Uh, they have. Um, um, also an extensive use of uh, modeling, like I was trying to film nothing in their place is designed without models. Um, I will go next to Kokuchia. Um, Kokuchia is um, a firm that um, uh, use um, computation in their design a lot and uh, they, I was trying to to talk with them about the use of parametrics and just to understand how do they go f um, from, you know, how do they use the tools and just to get more informed of uh, how they if produce their work. If you imagine our so operative models, the way we work, are based on um, developing complexity or developing emergence. So in this case you have the uh, Lorenzo tractor or a very well-known graph of complexity where you see bifurcations of possible results um, and then these things kind of exist in many places naturally so, so that's where we're coming from in terms of utilizing the computer to develop complexity or emergence that we see as having a qualitative characteristic to it that is useful for design purposes while at the same time being able to practical you know, negotiation. We do a lot of work with self-organization models or swarm-based models. Um, and on one hand, this can be about collectives forming something, um, but it can also be about behaviors in order to arrive at something. So in this case, that construction. Another thing we've been looking at from an abstract level, it's important to understand these when you see the other projects, is um, the kind of ornamental and organizational effects of self-organization um, and swarm-based behavior. So in this case we have, this was for an art project that was a completely abstract idea of a swarm where there is geometry instantiated in the swarm, but that that geometry is completely localized, it's not global. And that, um, and that although it's very heterogeneous, um, that there are s moments within it, like such as here, that produce near perfect symmetry. So you have hierarchies of thickness, of scale, and at the same time you have mo localized symmetries and things emerging, but they're not, the overall is completely heterogeneous. If we see something that seems ordered but strange, we kind of take note of it and learn from it because. Yeah, you can know you know when something's come emerged. This was a commercial tower project. It was looking at 
um, different fibrous organisations, how agents could develop along lines and start to self-organise in order to produce like um, a striated fibrous cell packing. And um, it was also looking at it from the kind of concept of Owen Howe's architectural screens where you could have relatively simple topological moves creating a more complex thing. So it was actually quite a rational project. Um, but it was trying to fuse these, you know, how I was mentioning before, these ideas of negotiating different designing terms or constraints. So it was trying to say, can you fuse the organisation of structure with the organisation of, um, of, you know, light, qualities of light and maybe ornamental effect? Can you kind of compress that into one design negotiation where, you know, these things come together? So in this case, it was an exoskeleton. What tools? Uh, we use we write our own algorithms. I mean, we tend to run within other packages, right standalone, but it's all our own code. Like, there's nothing in this that we didn't write. But we build on methodologies over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the two things we tend to use a lot of at the moment is processing, where we write, which is basically a version of Java, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Python and Rhino. I think at the present, they are one of the Design for uh, to investigate parametric. So uh, I was just trying to understand how they can justify some of the uh, designs and just to get a general <coughs> understanding of what they produce and how. So I was trying to touch, you know, the tools and um, and I was able uh, visiting uh, uh, AA to actually see the studio and the environment um, um, they have there to, you know, just to make a comparison between uh, uh, schools uh, here and uh, Delft University and um, AA. So I will just jump over. Uh, Ludovico Lombardi is also a um, um, graduate from AA School of Architecture and um, he is now working with Zaha he investigated um, urbanism uh, development uh, the way I was trying to investigate in my thesis. So I wanted to understand more about um, his project and uh, some of the decision they had to do along the way to understand you know, what was similar or what I could learn out of um, what they produced. I think I need to flip. The results of our individuals with different backgrounds over our parametric urbanism agenda. Our approach to urbanism was basically trying to find something that was responding or, let's say, rejecting the modernist approach of a replication, duplications, and standardized solution. And against that, we were trying to recreate something that was based on an idea of aesthetical forces, architecture of continuity, variation and gradation in order to achieve a coherent wall, but allowing for a lot of differentiation. So in that sense, we actually started looking and experimenting over fluid dynamic system to be actually the one that was giving us most of the we wanted to have in our urban design scheme. So um, we did a series of digital tests, of physical tests, by understanding how fluid occupies space, the way it reacts to external forces, the way it behaves when it encounters obstacles, the way it actually can be controlled and parameterized based on density and, and gives as a result a series of different behaviors, a different mass distribution. And in that sense we took that as a reference system in a way quite generic. So we started understanding the generic rules of it and the relation between those rules changed those parameters in order to react to the constraint of our site and our program. So in that sense we we kind of defined a generic system and then we made it specific once we actually tested it against our site and our constraint. What we understood was the understanding of digital system and parametric tools as an extremely powerful playground that was enabling us to test and deal with this immense amount of information and at the same time be able to control those information and, and reduce them to a series of generic codes and relations.
expectations and then put them back and and adapt them or having responding to our specific site looking back now i do believe that um it is not that different to what we're facing also in our professional life nowadays especially at SAS office uh, where every project is still um, engaging a sort of theoretical approach and aesthetic um, intent and a series of digital tools and within the digital realm at the same time there is still always a recognition of another sets of qualities that are obviously material qualities detail qualities uh, aesthetic values of coming from completely different non-digital practices or environment. It is clearly one of the most avant-garde way of, of understanding and using and designing spaces, but it is just a tool as a lot of others. So in that sense, we need to be careful not to fall into a sort of digital mannerism. Just thinking about how perspective changes um, the overall understanding and the design of space, how the technical achievement of researchers um, managed to create the most amazing coherent architecture so far, which is the Gothic example. And the, all of these are actually technical, if you want, and old only, obviously, but they had an impact on the way artists, thinkers, and architects were, were designing and understanding spaces. So obviously the, the digital environment and the parametric systems are, are something think about architecture but again this is something that is just a tool that enable us to experiment and become a playground for much more interesting theoretical research about adaptive system about responding system about bottom-up system on the other hand it's something that was already present in, in a lot of engineering researches in terms of performance and it is clearly affecting us and influencing the way we understand space but it is not the only way and obviously there's going to be an evolution to it so what I was trying to achieve uh, with, you know, just going and talking with people that are using parametric tool was more to uh, better understand in a way what I was trying to achieve with my thesis. And um, I wasn't disappointed in any way. Um, it seems like for everyone, uh, parametric is just a tool. You always need to go back and uh, filter your decision to uh, through uh, classical architectural um, parameters, if I can say. So um, next I went to Foster and I knew that uh, I became involved. they designed a um, few buildings that were um, using parametric um, tools but in a, again in a more practical way. So. Um, first building I will talk about is City Hall, but uh, they d don't talk about um, the parametric tools the way I was expecting. And the second one I will show you. Project in 1998. It's a fantastic site in terms of location in, in more or less a very regional from the uh, stations. And this was the original master plan, that, and the idea being that there's, that there's this desire line from London Bridge Station. There's a, there's a visual link towards the, the Tower Bridge, so this became uh, quite a driver for us in terms of the design. What makes the design of the, the building spherical? So it comes from a very simple mathematical understanding that uh, a sphere has less surface uh, area than a cube minimize heat gain. So for offices it's all about reducing heat into the building. The reason why it leans back is that it uh, gets uh, self-shading towards the sun and also further minimizing what the sun can see at its highest point. We really wanted to design this building as green as possible. At the top is the uh, active system, so that's photovoltaics, renewables, that kind of heat recovery system. So there's a lot of money, but you actually get very little gain. The biggest gain is in the form, so that's why the building um, is shaped uh, as it is. Everything starts off with uh, sketches, uh, ideas about, particularly here you can start to see the chamber. We work with a lot of models. Um, Three-dimensional testing is very important to us. It's, uh, it's the way we work, um, which we find helps us understand the three-dimensional nature of the building. So in terms of uh, a mathematical analysis of the form, it all comes down to just three arcs. So this just shows the, the, the impact on the heat, so the sun direction uh, on the building. And again, using that same information, the engineers were able to calculate 
what kind of uh, um, uh, energy uh, is, is being imposed on from, from the sun angle. So we can look at the, the solar gains on each of the panels. The tricky junctions because of the uh, complexity of the uh, building, lots of ramps, lots of slopes uh, coming in on one pair. So the only way to resolve them were really making models. You couldn't do it through CAD, which are difficult to see two dimensionally. Right? You really have to make physical models. And we, we produce a lot of these to, to understand how the geometries came together. And the, the, the ramps is really the main feature of the, the building, which is used for spectating, for um, going between floors, but uh, more often than not, more visitors use, use, use this space because it's very impressive. It's the feature of the building. The office is quite interesting the way we looked at this. Um, because the facade millions aren't, they're not vertical, they're sort of at an angle. Um, we, we felt that uh, it'd be more democratic to have this all open space. So there are very few partitions that would actually come into the uh, uh, the mullions, although you can do it. And then offices around the core, and this is something the, the office put up before they all moved in. Um, just a diagram of how the ventilation system works and the facade. So, so with the outside skin, there's a cavity in here which is externally ventilated. So a very low energy, um, lets, lets very little heat into the building. You see the PVs, the photovoltaic cells on top. So I was surprised that they didn't um, talk about parametric for um, defining the shape of the building and I was uh, um, informed that actually all um, the technical parts and all the sustainability that they were trying to achieve dictated the shape. So um, the building has a shape that you either you like it or not, but because they can justify each step they took or decision by uh, backing up with technical uh, and sustainable, uh, sustainable aspects, I think they did an amazing job. Um, the second project um, I was interested in um, is the Great Hall. Um, I knew um, they used parametric to define the, um, the, the roof and uh, what, uh, what they designed and I was just curious to see why. And uh Giles Robinson, a partner at Foster Partners uh, in London. So the Great Court was done obviously at a time where the office was fairly small. Um, it, the Great Court, it was um, originally a competition and then we were selected um, after that, uh, that process. Importantly, not for our design, but it was for our approach and our philosophy to designing the project. I think it's very important. Quite often, I think students think, you know, you do a competition scheme and the best one wins. Yeah. This was very clearly a, a competition to select an architect, not a design. So they wanted to see our approach, how we were thinking, how we'd work with them and communicate with them, how we would develop um, a project with them. Um, and I think, you know, I think that process is critical to the success of, of what we do. And I think it's very easy for people to say, oh, that's a great piece of design, whatever. But, it, but actually, that's just a snapshot. And really what's important is the, 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 the team, the relationships and how you develop and evolve um, a, a design through quite often many many years from design through through to construction to completion. Um, um, but I've, I've just brought some uh, images here. So um, what I was surprised to find out is um, that the parametric tool was used just to solve problems because of the existing building. Um, they couldn't um, uh, solve the intersection between of new and old without um, not applying a mathematical formula to actually um, be able to cover the space. And also it was the first time when I uh, heard that uh, um, it's for some of the competition is actually more important the team dynamics than, and the design uh, philosophy as overall than the design itself. and. Uh, more and more I'm exposed to that um, in the practical session where um, you need to build trust with the clients and um, um, it seems like everywhere is a viable 
the next uh, student in uh, Delft, um, I was talking about, he um, he's really famous for investigating uh, uh, parametric tools and uh, he's really active uh, in the uh, blogs and uh, I tried to find from him um, how I can de develop some of my thesis uh, uh, try, uh, problems or tools and um, he, meanwhile, was developing also an urban um, design. So what I want to do is just um, let him uh, talk. Um, he is really, really famous in uh, computation for his level. He got uh, to be one of the finalists in EVO this year. And uh, Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Dimitri Stefanescu, and I'm here to talk about the CISPRI project, which was developed alongside Patrick Berra. Basically, it consists of an environmental analysis, which is then mediated or, let's say, analyzed through the help of a multi-agent uh, swarm system. Um, and this, what this system basically does, it basically takes its function and addresses its uh, own environmental needs. So, for example, auditoriums want to be in highly circulated areas the same as info hubs, while uh, outdoor leisure functions like football fields and stuff like this want to keep as much as far away from highly circulated areas because, in a way, they need a lot of space and they need a lot of, uh, let's say, quiet, in a way. So, this multi-agent system, in a way, negotiated through all the environmental parameters as well as through the individual desires of each function. So some functions wanted to stay close to each other and some functions wanted to keep uh, very far from each other. Like uh, football fields and auditoriums don't go well together, let's say. And all this was basically top-down decisions, while the rest was uh, bottom-up or bottom-up approach regarding the whole placement. Uh, now, geometrical constraints were introduced as well during this simulation, but were actually formalized and crystallized in, in, in a proper, let's say, definitive form through, let's say, the post-processing of the whole thing, which was done, obviously, through parametric techniques, but um, mostly parametric techniques infused by our own architectural intuition because at the end we wanted to end up with a meaningful project like okay we have all this crazy geometry and what do we do with it it's useless if you can't actually fit an auditorium inside or if you can't fit a indoor badminton court inside so um, regarding this uh, parametric tools had quite a big role to play, as in we constantly uh, explored different variations and different shapings of the, of the um, whole project. Now, my opinion about parametric tools is that they are quite dangerous in itself. If you let them by themselves and if you don't master them, they, they can become really dangerous. So I always advocate, say, parametric abuses or alg algorithmic abuses. I always advise for, let's say, a uh, critical reflection before using them or before not starting to use them, but before actually letting them take over your project, which is actually very easy. I think he's talking clearly, he's one of the best, but all what he's saying is, uh, yeah, they're good, the tools are really good, but you need to know how to use them and you need to back them up with uh, architectural, stable and uh, you know, classical decisions. <coughs> um, so being in Delft, trying to interview uh, Dimitri, um, there was a workshop, a parametric workshop. Everywhere I went was <laughs> about parametric. So, um, <laughs> and um, I was trying in my proposal, I was trying to talk with Peter Group too, but I never got an answer back. So I was like, okay, many of them didn't answer back, so I lived with it. But um, Dimitri was saying, say, say, you know, there is this. Uh, workshop and this is the jury and this and this and Peter Cook. I was like, oh no, Peter Cook, I want to talk with him. So he was like, let's go. So, you know, by just coincidence and you know, <coughs> being in a, a circle of people interested in the same and networking, 
I end up actually interviewing P Peter Cook too. So unfortunately, the, the space I interviewed him uh, was full with people, so the sound is limited. I don't want to go into. But um, I was trying to ask him about the, the glass museum. Uh, why? So I will just go back to the image. Why? Why was that? Um, why was that the building designed this way? Is how can you tell the story? And all that he said is the site was boring. It needed something, so they designed something. <laughs> For him, architecture. For him, architecture is all about, as he said it, skins and schools. So as long as you cover your skin and you have a school, you're good to go. And the last term, I am not for you more than uh, one interview, uh, is with uh, 3D Max, the German firm, which is really famous for the graphic design from here in the beginning. Um, they did investigate a few pavilions and really conceptual from um, genetic architecture to a bionic pavilion. For me, those terms were, I want to understand more. I want to know what <laughs> they were trying to achieve. So uh, I, end, I end up going there. And if this will play, I will let you know what happened. I think uh, the guy is an amazing guy. He dropped out of school because the school was too boring for him. And it's a proof of, you know, if you are passionate about something and you work hard and you do what you love, it's impossible not to be successful. So uh, he will mention as a general um, design philosophy and with a few touches of uh, those two projects I was trying to investigate. So the way um, 3 relax approach is to design that we, um, we we try to leave the classical um, platforms of architecture, of interior architecture, of graphic design. So the idea very early was that we we want to work the, the interdisciplinary way. For us it's always interesting when things are not possible. When they are possible, the industry takes them and, and they're doing this in a commercial way and then for us um, it's not interesting anymore. And so um, for us it's always important that we have certain ideas and, and try to show them. But it's not important for us if they are now possible. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's for us our task as designers that we think a little bit in the future and then we have to see what will happen. Yeah. The idea of this um, bionic pavilion was that the architecture is based on natural principles um, and that on the other side um, with the design of it um, we could bring um, certain thoughts to people uh, just to say the society is changing, there are a lot of big influences coming. Like the new me media, new technologies, the virtual reality aspect is uh, becoming more and more important for everybody and so we just want to reflect this in our design, that's all. We have a lot of clients who want to have this design now, but we, for us, have, for us, it's not, not so interesting anymore, at least, so it's... Uh, um, we have like two fields, the field where we have to earn money and we, we do these things and the field where we try to, to develop new ideas but no client wants to have them now. And so I think the task is to, to bring these young, intelligent um, people um, who, who are experts in this field of, of engineering, green architecture, green, uh, that they play with these things. Our ideas are for, for the next years that things are not 
wide and beautiful and everything is integrated and it's floating and it's dynamic and it, that um, things are heterogeneous mm -hmm. and are, um, everybody uh, builds his own thing and uh, this little model of this building there of, of the addition things, of bringing things together which doesn't fit together at the first these are things which are for us um, interesting in the moment So what he was trying to say in a few words is that um, now they are famous for doing all those uh, really organic shapes The way and three lines go But this is what they investigated 10 years ago because their philosophy is we need to test something new, something exciting. They end up testing that a few years ago, but the clients and the um, people are becoming now exposed to it and they want it. So they are bored of it. They actually try to investigate something different but because they need to live and they need to produce and have money. They do that, but now what they are trying to investigate was what he was showing in the small models where not everything is so smooth and perfect. It's they need to show identity in an overall mass. So this is my thesis and um, I will just let it play and uh, tell you that the uh, intention for uh, my thesis was to investigate um, an urban design growth that was uh, sensitive to the culture and uh, the ecosystem in the site. Um, and um, because the site, I was familiar with the site, uh, was really an amazing place where um, the communist government just demolished houses and uh, uh, tried to impose an artificial lake which never was filled. The site was amazing um, uh, ecosystem in the middle of a big uh, site. So um, for me, it was really important that uh, whatever I was proposing as development um, would just fit uh, or coexist with uh, existing and um, as a model, I was trying just to get um, to learn from the history and get a prototype that I was able to um, apply. Um, and um, what I was choosing to to work with was a Han, a small um, cell that in the past for uh, uh, Romania was a social and economical. Um, um, cell in the city. So I was trying to reproduce that idea of cell to, um, uh, to the site and uh, uh, because I was trying to investigate a uh, big space, I was, I, I was in a way uh, guided towards parametric and um, uh, I started with physical models and they then started to investigate different uh, uh, design alternatives uh, with parametric tools and uh, talking with the the guy in Delft, I realized that was the best way to do is to start with models, start defining your goals, and then go and test with parametric tools for alternatives. So I had to go, um, I knew in a way from what I experienced, but uh, hearing from him and associated with, with the work I did, I, I thought um, unintentionally I did the best way of doing it. So. Um, with parametric tools, what you, what I end up uh, doing is defining some rules to be able to, to um, control what I was producing. I had to define the rules, and um, each um, prototype I was uh, defining, I was trying to, to test it through the certain tools. So if I go into the image that shows um, the design process I, I went through. Um, it will show you that um, I was uh, trying to investigate um, different um, different ideas, but filtering to the same uh, to the same rules. So for me, during the design uh, parametric was, was just a tool to expose me to to different um, different um, options. So the whole process I went through was that um, I 
I had to understand the site, I had to understand the culture. Um, out of that, I defined some rules, I defined some growing prototypes and um, parameters. And uh, for each uh, proposal, I had to um, filter, filter them to, uh, with the same uh, rules to end up um, um, deciding or um, uh, judging them uh, in the same. So overall, I end up having six proposals. Um, each one had a different outcome, even though uh, I was filtering with the same tool. Uh, with display. Um, so <coughs> the physical models, those are not uh, uh, renderings, they're just physical models. And, so this is I'm taking each <coughs> invention for the same colors and testing them, them based on mathematical um, rules like um, proximity, um, orientation, uh, height. Um, Up to this one just to, to make a connection with MDRDV. Um, we were in China working on a um, proposal for D3 competition, and I was working close with Po One and trying to develop uh, a, um, a city growth based on water as uh, a <coughs> system. So um, I, we were working and Somehow I was complaining something is not working, and whole one was just flip the model. It was about shading and flip the model, and uh, we flip the model, and this what? We got the special so many mention. Things I do. Even they do very well. So we we got the special mention out of uh, flipping the model. So. It seems like it's working. You need to sometimes just flip them out. <laughs> flip yourself. <laughs> um, I will stop here. I, I just want to say thank you, first of all, to Paul Wang, who with, uh, with all his encouragement and pushing and uh, discussion and friendly uh, you know, approaches. I will be here. I want to say thank you to school for sending me to see my dream coming true. Um, my thesis advisors, which uh, are here, uh, Jack Bull and uh, Ray Chikowski, the team who was really, really helpful, at least in the last part trying to help me as much as he can. I do appreciate that. Um, people in my office who were really supported, and I want to say thank you to Art Smith because uh, I'm working now due to him, and I'm working with a great team, and they listen to me all day. <laughs> um, the way they had, uh, you had to listen to, uh, to me for an hour, so guess what they go through every day. <laughs> um, and. Um, of course, I want to thank you to all of the people um, because um, going in Europe, I was amazed by how um, helpful they were. Um, they uh, they've been with me. Uh, for example, the Rollinet firm um, arranged for me one day pure my interview to go and visit the building and uh, had somebody drive me to the location and take me back. Uh, faster, they organized. Um, uh, one day before my interview to visit a uh, uh, great uh, you know, city hall, and I saw the, the um, you know the technology being in place before I talked with the guys in the office. But overall, what I want to say is that um, they all use tools. They don't count on them. They have a methodology. They always go through. They are really good team workers. They. Uh, build a really good relationship with the client. Projects are coming back to them because they prove 
the theme and the design philosophy is working. Um, also, I want to tell every student here who is trying to investigate uh, parametric is that there is a vocabulary you need to learn. Everyone is saying the same words. So we need to get familiar with them bef before we um, start talking about. Um, and always uh, what I learned from um, Peter from 3D Locks is be passionate. opportunity to spend a year working in one of these offices, what office would you uh, choose to work in and why? I thought it's an easy question and you asked me before and I thought it's faster and partners, but uh, working with the interviews and understanding uh, you know, all the firms, it's really hard because each one touches something that is working. So. I think Harley Ellis for now is best for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot, uh, it's not really a question. I just wanted to make a comment about the presentation that you're working with. You know, I, my first contact with you was in your first, well, obviously the master class, but after that, uh, I think it was Paul that came in and said, you know, I got the student building a city out of rubber bands. <laughs> I said, I'm there. Like I said, <laughs> And uh, then I kind of became somewhat addicted by going by and, and watching, ultimately, not necessarily what you were making, but the process in which you were making. And uh, it's really more of a statement to commend you on, you know, I, I kind of, in a way, find it ironic that you propose this and study this because you're trying to figure out uh, learning more about process. And as you talk particularly about the Zaha Hadid interview, I actually think you should hold a workshop for their office on process. <laughs> because, I mean, really what, what you do so well is you, first you're intellectually curious, which I think if you're not intellectually curious, it doesn't matter how smart you are or anything else. So you always are asking why. And then you follow that why up with a, with a digital and plus the physical investigation of that question. So you never, that I'm aware of, and all the time I've worked with you in China and then just kind of looking over your shoulder otherwise and fascination, you always build a model with an agenda. You're not building a model just because it's the pretty thing that you finish at the end. It's always a model that is investigating a line of inquiry. And if we could have every student in the school learn how to do that, we would elevate the work exponentially. And so I just commend you on that. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Nobody wants to know how much time I spend doing this. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, Corina, she knows a lot of uh, how much time. <laughs> Okay, we still have a little more to go here, but thank you so much, Alina. It's um, just a, a fantastic experience. And I think you know, one of the great things about the Pellerin is that um, it allows the winner to get out there in the world to experience something they haven't experienced before. But also, she has allowed us to get out in the world and experience something we haven't experienced before. Um, I'd just like to introduce uh, Adrian Abrams. She's the chair of the architecture and design chapter of the Alumni Association of LTU. She's going to make a few comments about um, 
about the alumni, but also how the Pellerin relates to uh, the alumni. Thank you for the introduction, Dean Nelson. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm so pleased that all of you could join us tonight for Alina's presentation. Um, Alina, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and uh, congratulations again. I'm all choked up from <laughs> um, So I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging the members of the Architectural Alumni Cabinet uh, who work very, very hard throughout the year uh, to advance alumni relations, uh, the College of Architecture Desi and Design and uh, programs such as the one this evening. Um, the Architecture Alumni Cabinet, uh, it's a volunteer excuse me, organization and the time and talents of these individuals contribute uh, to help advance this university are greatly appreciated. Uh, so if you are present, when I call your name, please stand to be recognized. I know, I have to be up here, you have to do it too. Um, uh, Kimberly Lipinski, and she is immediate past chair this year. Uh, Kathleen Lilienthal, chair elect, she'll be up here next year. Uh, Melissa Smucker is our secretary this year. Keith Logsdon, Salvatore Michelli, Ellen Rotter, I saw her here, there she is, uh, Russell Schoenrath, and Michael Schul. Um, I would also like to acknowledge our liaison from the University Advance Advancement Office, uh, Mary Randazzo. She is the person that makes everything happen. Um, so thank you all for your help and your service to this university. Um, as a cabinet, we recently embarked on a reorganization process uh, where we revised our bylaws and our strategic plan uh, to help us reach our goal as a cabinet in a more efficient manner. As a part of this process, we developed a number of committees uh, to work toward achieving various tactics. Um, we are always looking for volunteers uh, to help us achieve those tactics. So if anyone's interested in getting involved, please see any of the cabinet members in attendance tonight, um, or you can always contact Mary Randazzo from the oh. University City Advancement Office. Uh, you can also learn more about our cabinet um, and our specific committees by checking out our Facebook and LinkedIn sites, which we recently uh, got up and running this year. Um, we have a lot we want to accomplish, and we would appreciate any time and talents that you have to offer. Uh, one of the most important programs that our cabinet has been focusing on is the Peller and Traveling Fellowship Award, which is the highlight of this evening's event. Uh, the fellowship was established in honor of Dr. Earl Pellerin, who was the founding dean of the College of Architecture and Design. Uh, Dr. Pellerin firmly believed that travel was an important part of an architect's education. Uh, and to honor his memory, the Architecture Alumni Cabinet awards a travel study stipend to a meritorious graduate student annually. Uh, the award recipient is selected from a pool of nominees provided by architecture faculty uh, teaching graduate level studios. So each faculty member is able to nominate one student uh, from the fall or spring semester deemed to be worthy of this fellowship. Um, and I encourage those of you here tonight uh, who are taking a graduate level studio to strive to be nominated for this prestigious and rewarding travel study opportunity. Um, I will now turn the floor back over to Dean Nelson who will announce the 2011 Peller and Traveling Fellowship nominees and recipients. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Adrian. So one thing I love about the Pellerin, it's several awards all bound up in one. And to be a Pellerin nominee, I think is as remarkable as to actually be the, the final recipient of the Pellerin Award. So as Adrian was mentioning, the, um, the nominees are recognized for their outstanding design work, either in thesis or advanced uh, graduate design studio, um, or the, um, any graduate uh, studio. The uh, we had six nominees this past year, and I don't know how many are in the audience, but if you are, if I read your name and you're in the audience, please uh, stand up. Um, so the um, nominee number one was Seth LaRoque. Seth, can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Jonathan Crumpy, is Jonathan here tonight? Give him a round of applause anyway. 
Priya Iyer. Is Priya here? There's Priya. Craig Nietzsche. Craig's not here, but a round of applause for Craig. Stephen Cooper. Another round for Stephen. <laughs> and Christine Costa. Is Christine here? Now, I'll say a couple of things. It was um, <coughs> it was actually a difficult decision to um, to come up with uh, a, a winner for the actual Pellerin, Pellerin Traveling Fellowship, and uh, all of the six students I mentioned I, I, uh, over the last year, I've just heard so many wonderful things about each of these students, and I've seen their design work, all of them, and uh, I, I think. Um, Students coming up in the graduate program, undergraduate program, to, should look to uh, these students and their work as a kind of guiding light and guiding force in, in your own development because um, I think it, uh, it just demonstrates what LTU students are capable of and it's, it demonstrates the kind of work that we'd like to uh, have coming out of our program. So as I said, I think just being nominated as a Pellerin candidate um, is a meaningful thing, but ultimately we have to pick a winner. And how did we select a winner? Well, it's based really on the travel study proposal they put forward. And I think there are a number of um, qualities or characteristics of a strong travel study um, proposal. One of them is uh, there's a clear definition of engaging a culture outside of uh, the common culture that one grows up in. I think another is to um, have a clear and focused idea about what is going to be investigated or experienced. And maybe a third is just to have um, a, very, uh, a very meaningful and realistic proposal that actually can be followed through with. Now, uh, the winner must act as an ambassador for LTU. So we were also using a, a, a kind of lens to see if we could um, gauge that uh, individual's ambassadorship quality and would they be able to um, carry LTU out into the world as well as carry the world back to, to LTU. The, um, no, I'm trying to extend this as long as possible so everyone can get uncomfortable. <laughs> as I mentioned, is a difficult uh, decision. And in fact, the, it was sort of down to two proposals that we felt were um, very, very similar in um, their strengths, but quite different in terms of how they were framed. Both of them looked at architecture through people and through um, a connection to profound dimensions of life. It wasn't architecture as an object. It wasn't architecture as a technology or a mechanism. It was really about life, people, environment, and how architecture and design can connect with, with all of those things. Um, The title of the winning proposal was Design, Mobility, Food, Community. And Priya Iyer is the winner. <laughs> now let me just say a couple of words, and maybe, I don't know if Priya wants to even have a few words at the very end here to uh, wind down the evening. But a couple of things. I think we, um, as we reviewed the proposals and discussed the proposals, um, we felt like we felt that that Priya's travel study, which is actually in the continental U.S. but a nation within our nation, she's uh, going to visit the Santo Domingo Pueblo in New Mexico, and uh, connect with the um, an American Indian Health Center on the reservation. And she will also go to San Francisco, California and uh, engage the Food Cart Initiative for Migrant Hispanic Women. 
both of these, um, uh, pe the people and places in, uh, that she's going to visit relate to her graduate uh, design studio work, also relate to her current work uh, dealing with um, food and community here in Detroit. And it was our belief that um, what Priya will encounter in the travel study will be something that will open her world, but also allow uh, something to come back to Detroit and our community. And it uh, seems like it's very focused and very relevant. Just turning off again. Um, I think we also felt that, um, that Priya's proposal was very concise very explicit and very focused and uh, that gave it a particular strength and she was um, she was able to define a realistic travel agenda within the funding available and the time available with um, what we felt might be a maximum amount of um, information and experience gleaned. Uh, I personally have uh, worked with Priya in this last year and she was in uh, a design studio that Ed Orlowski and I led last spring. And I just found uh, Priya to be tough and sensitive, resilient and creative, and focused and smart. And I think all those things were very clear in, in her proposal. So another round of applause for Priya. <laughs> Madam Priya, would you like to say a couple of words, just generally, about, uh, or maybe you can speak more specifically about what you intend to do? You can hold it. Yeah, I think I can hold it. Well, first of all, thank you so much. This is a great honor. I cannot believe that this is happening to me. Um, I am absolutely passionate about community development, and that's kind of where the heart of my proposal stemmed from. Um, over the summer, I've been working with uh, the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation and working on a very specific project called the Green Grocer Project, which is all about revitalization of the grocery stores and the food in Detroit. Um, through that, I got connected uh, with a federal grant that was uh, granting a whole bunch of people all over the United States to undertake various initiatives to help food access to the poorest people in the country. And that's kind of the, where the heart of this proposal came from, um, is the two communities that I'm exploring are also part of this uh, larger kind of um, grantee list. Um, and hopefully uh, DGC will support me and help me uh, connect with these people and explore more the challenges and um, I guess ultimately the promise of design. Thank you. So I think that concludes the evening. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it very much.